This is David Bertelson, an amateur naturalist who lives in Tucson, Arizona. For nearly 30 years, he's hiked up the Catalina Mountains once or twice a week. Along the hike, he makes observations on about 600 species of plants. Bertelson faithfully records when individuals of each species are blooming. These observations are helping to quantify when particular species flower at different elevations, what climatic conditions trigger their flowering, and the degree to which flowering time is changing with climate. Many factors can affect the timing of flowering at different elevations. For plants that flower in late summer, rainfall is more important at lower elevations, but temperature has a greater influence at higher ones. Because temperature decreases with elevation, giant saguaros growing at higher elevations flower later in the summer than those growing lower. Summers have gotten warmer and saguaros are now blooming earlier than they did in the 1980s when Bertelson began making observations. The dedication of Bertelson and volunteers like him are essential for determining how climate affects the timing of events in the seasonal cycle of plants and animals. The study of these timings is a far-reaching science called phenology. Everybody does phenology. Everybody is aware of what phenology is. They may just not know the name. So phenology technically is the study of the timing of life cycle events for plants and animals. For example, when do flowers of a particular species come out? Or when do migratory birds arrive? or what, a, what controls the timing of the hibernation of bears. Phenology is actually all-encompassing. It's very much of an integrative science. And uh, it involves lots of things that are important to us, both from a fundamental scientific standpoint and also uh, from a practical standpoint. It can be important for predicting allergy season. As the timing of flowering times of plants change, so will the timing of allergy season change. If we follow phenology, we can uh, be able to predict how allergy seasons will change. If you like maple syrup, and maple syrup, the timing of when maple syrup runs in the spring, when those trees start to produce uh, sap for maple syrup, there's actually evidence that the timing of that is changing. And so if you're someone who's in the maple syrup stands and collecting maple syrup in, say, uh, Michigan, you need to know when to go out and start tapping the trees. Tracking phenology puts you in touch with the seasonal cycle and can be applied to interesting local applications like gardening and it also provides when recorded over the entire continent important information for assessing global change. And it actually was identified by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change as one of the simplest and least expensive metrics to measure to document how biological systems are changing. And so there have been on and off over all of history efforts to monitor phenology. In fact, there have been international efforts to monitor phenology. Back in the 1920s, for instance, it was being monitored in the, in the U.S. by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and uh, the Royal Meteorological Society in the U.K. and other folks in the world. And so there were efforts to get, get a lot of monitoring going. Um, in the U.S., those efforts kind of fell off. We don't monitor phenology at the right spatial scales over large areas, and we also don't monitor demography, in other words, births and deaths, on similar scales. So we really can't answer the question of how the timing of events in the annual life cycle of plants and animals affects the abundance of those same plants and animals. In the 1950s, a guy working for the U.S. Department of Agriculture named Joe Caprio started monitoring lilac phenology. Uh, across the western United States. I initiated the phenological survey in the western region in which we had cooperation of weather service people throughout the whole area, more than 1,500 people observing the lilac and the honeysuckle, two species of honeysuckle. And uh, <clears throat> this went on from 1956 to 1993, more than 35 years. Caprio's Western States Phenology Network engaged loyal volunteers from local garden clubs, county agricultural agencies, and weather networks. We initiated that survey in which the people were given a card to report the beginning, the peak, and the end of the lilac occurrence, the bloom. And uh, we sent those out to the observers. They reported and recorded the data and sent it back to us 
at Montana State University. Caprio's network eventually spanned 12 western states and included 2,500 observers by 1972. In 1961, it inspired a similar network in the eastern United States. The LILAC data from Caprio's network is critical for evaluating the recent advance in the onset of spring. Today, Caprio's data are an invaluable asset to researchers who are making every effort to maintain and expand this network. Recently, Mark D. Schwartz of the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and Julio Betancourt of the U.S. Geological Survey realized that a national network would be needed to observe not just lilacs, but also a broader assortment of species. In 2005, Betancourt, Schwartz, and their colleagues initiated a plan to create a national phenology network that would not depend on any single individual or institution for its survival. I was pleased to receive information and participate in the development of the National Phenology Network. So the National Phenology Network has been around only for a few years. Really, we opened our doors in 2007 and have been busy building a program since then. But the idea for a national network for phenology emerged when scientists from around the country got together to try to answer how do we understand the effects of climate change on natural ecological systems. The forests and the grasslands and the lakes and streams that we all depend upon. The network is envisioned as a partnership of academic institutions, public agencies, non-governmental organizations, and the general public, with the intent of monitoring plant and animal phenologies on a continental scale. So what we're trying to do is create a program that allows professionals and citizen scientists alike to collect uh, phenology data that can be used by managers and scientists to uh, understand how species are responding to climate change and to understand how we might be able to manage those responses. One of the questions that you might have is exactly how, you're going to, how are you going to monitor the annual life cycle of literally hundreds of plants and animals across the United States. That sounds like something that would take a tremendous amount of manpower. And uh, you're not going to do it with scientists. The success of the network will depend on participation by scientists and volunteers across the U.S. to make periodic observations of plants and animals around where they live and work. So while phenology provides crucial data necessary for assessing global change, the data themselves are relatively simple measures that anyone can record and observe in their own backyard. Anybody can, anybody can participate. It doesn't matter whether you live in the country or you live in the city. It doesn't matter whether you live in the north or the south. You can find a plant to monitor from our plant list, look at an animal protocol, and figure out how you would monitor animals and report animals, and get involved with the network. Phenological observations can be made by anyone in nearly any location. They consist of easy-to-observe phenomena, and these observations can be integrated with daily activities, like walking to work or relaxing in your backyard. I, I, wanted, I just thought it was interesting and wanted to see patterns, and, and the more I looked at them, it, I guess the, the most amazing thing is there's no one year is, is like another year. They're all different. And every time I went up this trail, I saw something new. There are patterns that you can see when you do it year after year, that, that uh, there are lots of surprises. You never know for sure what you're going to see. You have to be curious, though, and you have to be persistent. Those are the two qualities I think you have to have. So we have about 3,000 uh, observers. Each one of those observations is critical until we grow the network to, let's say, 40, 50,000 to 100,000 observers across the country, those observations are going to be fairly critical. One of the biggest things that we've been focusing on lately has been to create um, a program by which individuals of any age and any skill level can participate in keeping track of phenology of plants and animals. Um, this program is called Nature's Notebook and it's available via our website, www.usanpn.org and it gives very explicit instructions for people on how to track the plants or the animals in their area. So you can actually go to our website at www.usanpn.org 
and uh, register as an observer and start making observations right now. Um, so you can go in, access our protocols for a particular species that you're interested in. You can make those observations and enter them as you go on, as you go along. Uh, so every time you make observations, you, you can actually enter those observations and they come in to the clearinghouse and then they get digested and they get mapped. And uh, so you're actually able to see the products of your observations relatively quickly. Phenological observations have a number of uses, including interpreting satellite images of vegetation. Satellite data is the only way to really get an, uh, an instantaneous view of the whole world at one particular time of the year. Uh, there's, there's no uh, other technique really available uh, unless you have everybody all over the world taking measurements on the ground. You have still point measurements while the satellite actually measures an integrated signal for the whole uh, Earth surface. So the satellite integrates these signals and you see everything for the whole world at, at one particular time uh, of the day uh, and you don't can do that with any, anything else. Satellites can provide generalized observations of vegetative growth at local to global scales, but provide little information about specific species. Uh, the satellite basically doesn't discriminate if a plant is green, a plant is green, and the satellite has a hard time discriminating if, uh, between different green plants, basically. So it's, it actually says if you have, a, you have grassland and you have a cornfield and you have a forest, uh, for a satellite, all, all that looks pretty green, so you quite often have to have more detailed information that you need to actually identify what kind of plants are there. Phenological data and models are useful in agriculture, drought monitoring, and fire prevention, and can help manage wildlife, invasive species, and the spread of disease. The National Phenology Network will serve many practical and scientific needs in our nation's future. Observing phenology can help us adapt to the world around us. So why not join the USA National Phenology Network's observation team today and begin reading the local pages in Nature's Notebook.